Three, two, hey everybody, hey everybody, welcome back to This Week in Startups, we have a jam-packed episode for you today. First, we're going to chop it up, we're going to do a post-mortem on the weekend that was, the bank failure weekend, Silicon Valley Bank uh, going out of business, and the Fed backstopping everything on Sunday. This all happened in 48 hours, I'm going to explain some of my tweets for those of you who are wondering why I was in caps mode, and then we have a great interview with Andrew R. McHugh, he is the co-founder and CEO of Wist Labs, which is creating a VR technology that lets you record and then relive in 3D your memories. Record on your phone and then relive your memories in VR. It's an amazing conversation. And we're going to talk about not just reliving your memories and all the ethical, interesting concerns that can come up from that, but the why now. All the camera upgrades in the new iPhone that enabled WIS's technologies and some startup advice on how to raise money and the ideal customers uh, and some WIST Labs use cases and features. It's going to be a great show, so stick with us. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Pilot. Grow your business sustainably and operate more effectively. Pilot provides the most reliable accounting, CFO, and tax services for startups and small businesses. Head to pilot.com slash twist and get 20% off the first six months. LinkedIn Marketing. To redeem a $100 LinkedIn ad credit and launch your first campaign, Go to linkedin.com slash this week in startups and brilliant.org. Brilliant is the best way to learn math, science, and computer science interactively. Try everything Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days and get 20% off an annual subscription at brilliant.org slash twist. Hey everybody, it's March 13th, 2023. And it has been a long weekend. For those of you looking back on this episode as a historical document, this is the weekend, uh, the Monday after the weekend where Silicon Valley Bank went out of business, was taken over by the FDIC. And we had complete chaos for startups, investors, and that chaos started to tip over into uh, the civilian community. And when I jokingly say civilians, I'm kind of talking about the military talking about everybody who's not in the military. I'm talking about everybody who is not in tech and capital allocators, uh, venture capitalists, angel investors, seed investors, etc. And if you follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash Jason, I was uh, tweeting up a storm with my caps lock on because it was a crazy weekend. Venture capitalists all over the Bay Area this weekend to give you the inside baseball witnessed on Thursday, the bank run of Silicon Valley Bank, this bank run did not occur on Twitter. Because a Wall Street Journal uh, reporter contacted me and said, I want to talk about the impact of Twitter <laughs> on the bank run. And I was like, well, the bank run happened in private on email and on group chats, the and Slack channels, those kind of things. The reaction to Silicon Valley going up, uh, going belly under on Friday uh, was what happened on Twitter over the weekend. On Thursday, we witnessed everybody talking about Silicon Valley Bank potentially going out of business, obviously on Wednesday. And we've been over this a couple of times on the Friday emergency pod for this week in startups and all in episode 119 this weekend. It was uh, chaos Wednesday night into Thursday and then into Friday. And what we witnessed was an absolute run for the doors at Silicon Valley Bank. And then that went to other regional banks. And I don't want to single out specific banks, but obviously you saw a lot of press around First Republic. Uh, which is a fantastic bank. Silicon Valley Bank is a fantastic bank. I have worked with them, both of those firms for maybe decades now. Uh, and they have serviced all of our startups. I love both of those firms. Both of them have been advertisers on this uh, and, and supported different events I've done. I have accounts at both of them. I do not have exposure to either one. I do not have a position. I haven't J traded at either firm, although I literally was involved in a discussion is now the time with First Republic Bank being down 60% today on Monday, March 13th to buy <laughs> First uh, Republic Bank. Anyway, long story short, we watched as people fled Silicon Valley Bank for First Republic. Then we saw people saying, hey, you know what, I don't want to be in any of the regional banks, I want to be in one of the top four banks. So if this is a bank run, and it hits contagion, then uh, we can at least be in the top four banks, and there will be like safety in those larger banks. This was terrifying to witness up close and personal because it was the prisoner's dilemma where like either you leave or you stay in jail forever and your money's locked up. So the logical thing for any founder to do was to get their money out. Uh, and the logical thing for any investor or board member to do was to tell them to get their money out. And, and this is the definition 
of a bank run. It's why we have this term. It's why it's so terrifying because it has to do with the psychology of individuals more than it has to do with logic. If everybody acted logically, like in It's a Wonderful Life, and they just took out the money they needed, uh, you wouldn't have a bank run, right? So, and and this precludes uh, any postmortem on Silicon Valley Bank. But on Saturday, we had no reaction uh, from the President of the United States, Janet Yellen, just the Fed. Everybody seemed to be asleep at the wheel. And what we were doing in Silicon Valley to give you the inside baseball is we were looking at the companies impacted and we were trying to figure out which companies raising money in our portfolio had money at Silicon Valley Bank and who was going to make payroll on Monday. And we had identified six or seven companies in our portfolio that had what I would call significant exposure. In other words, they might have had all their eggs in one basket. There were people who had exposure, but it wasn't life threatening. It wasn't in the next week or two, we're not hitting payroll. So we had to do this crazy triage. This is a very intense thing. So Friday night, I'm in board meeting Saturday, board calls, threads, documents flying around. How do we get $200,000? How do we get $2 million? How do we get $750,000? And so I'm saying, holy cow. Uh, and I just told my founders, if anybody can't get their money out, we'll do personal loans to um, those companies, not investments in the company for equity, because then you have to decide, well, what is the valuation of the company? And this could be particularly challenging, because then you have to get a group of people who are on the board, you might have five major investors, a major investor is somebody with say over 250k or a million dollars in a startup. So let's say you have five of them. Okay, we're going to put a million dollars into this company. Okay, what is the company worth? Well, oh, it raised money in the peak valuation market last year. It's not worth that much. Okay, now you have to have a, have a negotiation and the talk, the clock is ticking. And what if everybody doesn't agree? So somebody came up with a really good idea. It was one of our founders, in fact. And I think other folks uh, were also coming to the same conclusion. We'll just give you a loan. When the money is released from Silicon Valley Bank, which we all think it will be at some point, and maybe it's 80 cents on the dollar or 90 cents or 50 cents, whatever it winds up being, oh, you just pay this back. We don't have to convert it into equity. And so we started that process. Some people wanted to do uncapped notes which is very convenient for the founder. Uh, and, um, you know, just throw the money into the company. But in some cases, venture firms then have to make a decision, do they want to own more equity? So this is the chaos of putting a gun to people's head and saying, invest in this company now or it goes away. It's really, really stressful. So we offered all of our founders impacted a loan. Uh, this would have equaled for our small seed fund, half a million to a milli. And that would have covered a couple of weeks. And then we would have been back at the half million to a million train, I think, within a couple of weeks if this stuff didn't get released. To say this is stressful is an understatement because you would have had people losing their, uh, they would have had to furlough their staffs. They would have to say, hey, we don't have money to pay you. In addition to that, there are regulations. If you have over a certain number of employees in your company, you then could be responsible, the board could be responsible, management could be responsible if you didn't lay them off properly, you know, if you have over 100 or 200 employees, you can look it up, depends on the state, there are plant shutdown laws, where you have to give enough warning, typically 60 days, sometimes as, as long as 90 days, I think here in America. Okay, so uh, we start trying to alert the public. And so I went all caps. And I said, Listen, you should be terrified right now. And you can go back and look at my tweets. I did delete one tweet. I'll talk about that in a second. But I just really tried to make it clear to people that this was going to be a full contagion. Why did I think this was going to be a full contagion? Well, because I saw Silicon Valley Bank, then I saw First Republic Bank, and then I saw other banks. And all of a sudden, people were like, you know what? Just go to the top four. And when I saw that happen within 36 hours, the money moving around, it became clear that this was not going to be one or two banks. And then I'm at a dinner party on Saturday night. And some people are in the industry, some people are not uh, here in the Bay Area. And the people who are not, we're starting to know about the headlines. And then we start seeing pictures of banks, where people are lining up at banks. And I said, Oh, my Lord, this is tipping over into retail or small businesses. And of course, Silicon Valley Bank has a lot of small businesses. They're just called startups. And then it has you know, there are people who are using Silicon Valley Bank who have wineries or restaurants or other small businesses. So it became clear, this was a full on contagion, I believe we were already in a contagion over the weekend, if you define contagion by this is going to other banks. People told me I was being crazy, people told me I'm trying to cause a bank run. No, 
I witnessed a bank run and I witnessed other bank runs underway. And I told folks, listen, please don't blame the person who sees a fire and then sees another fire and then pulls the fire alarm. All of this FUD started coming out. People are saying Silicon Valley is trying to force the government to do this because they have exposure. I don't have any personal exposure. Most VCs are fine. They have a couple of portfolio companies, but again, it's a portfolio. By definition, we are diversified as VCs. Who's not diversified? The employees and the owners of these businesses are largely not diversified. They don't have 10 companies. They don't have 10 jobs. There might be some people who work two or three jobs. There might be some people who are independently wealthy and, and are resilient, but there's not built in diversification. So I didn't have a short position or a long position. I was not talking my book. I was literally trying to make sure everybody in the public, people in Washington, people in our industry, people adjacent to our industry understood that this was going to result in, I believe, thousands and thousands of companies going out of business and tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people losing their jobs. And that on Monday, you could see 100,000 people lined up at banks. Now, if that seems alarmist, that was the intent. I was literally pulling the alarm. Because when you see two or three banks starting to have these runs on them, it doesn't take a genius to realize when the public finds out that smart people have taken their money out, they should do the same. And then the worst thing happened. People started to hear that there were predatory hedge funds offering Silicon Valley Bank customers 60 or 70 cents on the dollar. That was even worse than is there a bank run or is there not? Because if you're saying, there is a bank run or there isn't, some people will believe there's a bank run. And some people will say, no, these are too big to fail. Once you say people have valued the holdings there at 60 or 70 cents on the dollar, I believe 100% of people rush to the bank and say, well, at least I'll get my 60 cents it's better than nothing. This literally is the plot of It's a Wonderful Life. The, 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 the villain in it starts offering people 50 cents on the dollar. If my memory serves me correct, it's been a decade maybe since I've seen it. Hey, everybody, I'm here with Basim Daher. He is the CEO and the founder of Pilot. You know, they provide accounting, CFO, and tax services for startups. You work with a ton of founders. How do you think founders should think about paying themselves? This is something where I see founders get themselves in trouble. Yeah, so there's a bunch of stuff here. One is we actually have a bunch of really good data on this. We did a founder salary survey to mm -hmm. kind of give you the aggregate stats. I think the, the real take home, though, is... You don't want to pay yourself too much, but importantly, you also don't want to pay yourself too little. Like if you're mm -hmm. agonizing about, should I take the Uber or the bus home? Uh -huh. that, that's energy that you should be spending on making your company successful. And so I think the, the classic trap, and it's a little bit reinforced by some investors, is you got to make sure you're paying yourself enough to cover your expenses. And if you're not, it's not going to lead to good outcomes for the company. Yeah, you don't want the founder worrying about how to make their rent every month, nor do you want the founder paying themselves nothing and then some balloon payment. Y you want to just be on a nice, steady, reasonable salary that everybody agrees with and, and having the data to make that discussion just easy breezy is critically important. Totally. All right, everybody, here's your call to action. Twist listeners can get 20% off their first six months at pilot.com slash twist. That's pilot.com slash twist for 20% off your first six months. Thank the Lord. At 3.15 or so on Sunday, my time in Pacific, I guess 6.15 in New York, uh, and you know, early in the morning before the Asian markets were about to open, Janet Yellen comes out, uh, and she had been on the morning uh, press shows like Face the Nation saying, hey, we are concerned about the depositors, but not the shareholders of Silicon Valley Bank. Fair enough. Uh, we all agree with that. And they said, but that was also not convincing. She said, we're aware of it, but she didn't uh, give the exact statement. Of course, then we had um, the Fed and everybody do a joint statement that they would backstop this. Thank the Lord. If they had not backstopped it, I think we would have seen a half dozen, a dozen or more banks uh, go out of business uh, this week. And finally, the president this morning on Monday uh, came out and took a victory lap and tried to calm everybody down. This should have happened. This should not have come down to the wire. This should have been done on Saturday. Like if everything was done a day earlier, or if on Friday, they said, hey, we're going to backstop this. I, I, I do I am reasonable enough to think 
that the Fed or our government might need a day to process stuff, but they need to act much faster in the future when this happens. Because apparently, Signature Bank, a company none of us, a- another bank that none of us had known was going to go under, they also got taken over on Sunday in this announcement. So you had the other, co- you had the, you had the banks that people were buzzing about. Maybe they're going to go out. Maybe they're not going to go out of business or have a run. And then this other one comes out of nowhere. So we had two bank failures, one known, one unknown in two days. Let it sink in, folks. Uh, this is a crazy uh, turn of events. Thankfully, I think First Republic seems uh, pretty secure. Uh, and if there's a $25 billion facility, I think we are good. Uh, I, I do believe that the Fed coming out and uh, the president coming out saying we're going to backstop the depositors and the money in these banks, not the banks themselves, the management teams of the banks, the equity holders of the banks, they they take some amount of risk and have some amount of responsibility for running these companies. So they should not get a bailout is the consensus in Silicon Valley, Main Street and Wall Street. I think we all agree with that we shouldn't be bailing people out if they didn't do a great job. And I don't want to say Silicon Valley Bank did a terrible job or a great job. I'll let uh, you know, a couple of weeks go by for people to assess that obviously, they didn't do an optimal job. Um, but I hear people talking about fraud or malfeasance. There's no evidence of that yet. So I think people should really pause and listen, I was on social media speculating all weekend. But this was intelligent, informed speculation based on what I was seeing. So some of it was speculation. Hey, I think there's going to be a bank run on Monday. But it was based on I just witnessed two or three bank runs. And I'm witnessing a contagion as we speak. Here is the President of the United States. Last week, when we learned of the problems of the banks and the impact they could have on jobs of small businesses and banking system overall, I instructed my team to act quickly to protect these interests. All customers who had deposits in these banks can rest assured, I want to rest assured they'll be protected and they'll have access to their money as of today. That includes small businesses across the country that bank there and need to make payroll, pay their bills, and stay open for business. No losses will be borne by the taxpayers. Instead, the money will come from the fees that banks pay into the deposit insurance fund. Second, the management of these banks will be fired. If the bank is taken over by FDIC, the people running the bank should not work there anymore. Third, investors in the banks will not be protected. They knowingly took a risk, and when the risk didn't pay off, investors lose their money. That's how capitalism works. And fourth, there are important questions of how these banks got into the circumstance in the first place. We must get the full accounting of what happened and why those responsible can be held accountable. And finally, we must reduce the risks of this happening again. During the Obama-Biden administration, we put in place tough requirements on banks like Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Unfortunately, the last administration rolled back some of these requirements. I'm going to ask Congress and the banking regulators to strengthen the rules for banks to make it less likely this kind of bank failure would happen again. Uh, The thing we haven't heard about right now is if Silicon Valley Bank has a buyer, there was supposed to be an auction, all the bids were supposed to be in Sunday, according to Bloomberg. We haven't seen a buyer yet, but I'm taping this at about noon Pacific time. We'll see uh, on Monday, we'll see if somebody is going to buy it. I think the um, European uh, portion of Silicon Valley Bank has found a buyer already. Uh, that's what I heard on, so on uh, CNBC late last night. So that seems to be have seems to have been handled. Uh, First Republic sent out uh, a notice that they uh, they had raised a bunch more money, more and they had 70 billion in unutilized liquidity to fund operations. So it feels like everybody's shoring things up. And I believe uh, we are majority out of the woods here. There are unknowns. I did see some reports of people lining up at banks. Who knows what's true right now, but it doesn't seem like it's chaotic. So uh, what should founders do at this point? What should we take away from all of this? Well, the obvious one is you can't have all your money in one bank. And you can't have one bank doing this load balancing across other money market accounts, because if that bank goes out of business, in this test, it turns out you can't log in and get access to those. So you have to have access via at least two 
probably three or four banks, and you should be load balancing your money across a couple of them. It doesn't mean it has to be equal amounts, but let's just say the best practice is probably going to be you have one main bank, and then maybe you have three others. Those three others have one pay cycle each. In other words, two months worth of uh, payroll. And you're just sitting there with, you know, a bullet in each bank. So you have three pay cycles, six weeks, you know, uh, safely tucked away. I know this is a pain in the neck. I know this creates extra work. But I think this is what uh, the new standard will be. This is what I'm going to advise people this week when they ask me and I'm doing it right now here on the show for everybody. I think let's say your payroll was 100,000. You're putting 110,000 in three different bank accounts that you don't touch uh that you don't have fees on and hey listen now you got three great banking relationships and then you've got let's say you had four million in total funds then you've got the other three point x million in your main account some people might say put 500 500 500 and have 2.5 we'll we'll come to some reasonable conclusion of what makes sense what that also does is now if you have four of these bank accounts at least you have the fdic limit of 250k what should our government do i think that 250k needs to be a million uh, or a half million or 2 million. And maybe there could be a way of paying for more. In other words, you have FDIC insurance provided by the government, but maybe there's an FDIC pro. Uh, and, you know, certain banks could offer that to certain customers. And there could either be a fee for it that's paid for by the bank or shared by the bank uh, and individuals. But maybe we, it's time to think about raising that limit or having uh, some way to engage in a higher limit. I'm sure there's going to be third party services that offer these kind of insurance uh, products. Maybe they exist already. I've just never heard of them. Somebody let me know if there's an insurance product that, you know, will give you your million dollars, uh, whatever's not covered, the 750 of a million that's not covered instantly in the case of a bank run. If that does exist, I'd like to know about it and how much it costs. And it probably will depend on which bank you're in order. And, you know, that can happen very simply. One partner at a firm can just suggest at the Monday morning meeting, you know what, this seems like a dicey environment, let's circle the wagons, let's focus on our portfolio companies insuring them up. Uh, and let's just do that for six 12 weeks. Now, when a lot of people start doing that, then founders who are trying to raise money, the competition for those dollars went from, okay, we've got, let's just say a 1000 firms actively investing, it's more than that, but I'm just gonna say a 1000. Okay, half of them went into circle the wagons mode. Now it's down to 500. Okay, now the 500, half of those, now you got 250 funds that are active seed funds that are looking for deals. Okay, if there were also a um, 1000 startups looking for funding, or let's say 2000, it was two startups for every one firm. Now it's eight startups for every one firm, right? And, and so your chances just dramatically, dramatically got lowered. I hope this is helpful. We're going to be covering this all week long. If you would like to send the producers any questions or ideas you have for segments this week as we work through this, it's producers at thisweekinstartups.com. And next up, a great interview with a founder. I'm looking to have more seed uh, stage startups on the company. We really do a great job of getting Snowflake and public companies and legendary founders on the pod. Because I'm old, and I got a lot of friends who've been doing this for decades. What I'd like to do is get the early stage founders back on this week in startups. That's my commitment for this year. So I'm looking for those seed stage, really interesting products that are just coming to market, have a couple of customers, if you have ideas for really compelling, interesting, innovative, not, you know, copycat products, let's say, just innovative stuff, things that are unique in the world. I'm looking for the unique new things that need support producers at this week in startups.com. You can pitch your own company, or you can pitch a company you find. Uh, out there in the wild. So uh, more founders doing interesting things in the pod, including our next one, which has a science fiction like product that lets you relive memories in VR. Stick with us. Let's talk about marketing to senior level executives, you know, the people that make purchasing decisions, when you're selling business to business solutions, or services software, whatever your jam is, you want to reach the decision makers, right? It's great to reach the end users that's part of the game but the decision makers who approve the purchase it's so hard to find those people but there is a solution and i think you know about it and that platform is linkedin now you know linkedin has almost a billion members but did you know they have 180 million senior level executives 
and the 1%, those 10 million C-level executives, they're on the platform as well. And they have a ton of purchasing power and they use LinkedIn. Why? That level of executive is obsessed with doing competitive intelligence on LinkedIn, looking for new talent. They're there. They have to be there. LinkedIn ads is specifically built for B2B marketers. That's you. No other platform in the world can offer you these kind of eyeballs. And it's just so easy to do. LinkedIn equals business, business equals LinkedIn, and you can slice and dice the audience by their title, by what vertical they're in, what geo they're in. And listen, they can back it up. Audience exposed to brand messages on LinkedIn are six times more likely to convert above average. Make B2B marketing everything it can be and get a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash this week in startups to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash this week in startups terms and conditions do apply. Next up on the show, Andrew R. McHugh is with us. He is the co founder and CEO of a company called Wist Labs, formerly known as vivid. Um, tough name for a video startup. Yeah, you know, don't Google it. He first founded Wist in 2021. Previously, he was a senior at VR and AR design lead at Samsung. And when I saw this go by my feed on the socials, I said, uh, find out who built this and get him on the pod. And here he is, Andrew R. McHugh. Welcome to This Week in Startups. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. All right. Let's just get right to it. Um, let's tell the audience what you built. And for those people watching the video on YouTube or Spotify, they can see it. So we'll roll the tape and you can sportscast it. Yeah, definitely. So Vivid is a great way to uh, step back inside your memories just by capturing a video. As this video starts playing, you'll see uh, my wife. She's pregnant at the time. She has her phone out. She's capturing our cat there. There's a little bit of processing. Um, and then she can walk back through that same memory in mobile AR or here in VR. So she's putting on a Quest headset. She's in this virtual world. And that like memory video is like reprojected back into space again. Yeah, it's like a, a really powerful experience. Um, in some of these captures, you'll see like my wife had an ultrasound at a certain point in time. And so I was able to like capture that in 3D. And then my mother, who's back in Missouri, she could like step back in that memory again with me as though as though she were there. Okay. Yeah. This feels like science fiction. In fact, yeah, absolutely. There's a couple of movies, uh, Strange Days mm -hmm. and Minority Report, which I think use a very similar format were either of these and i'm asking genuinely mm -hmm. if you're a fan of these films or if either of these were in some way inspirational or uh, yeah, yeah yeah i mean i think i think there's like um a large amount of like reference in popular media so also including like black mirror um there's a video game called cyberpunk that has like a, a similar sure. idea um harry potter there's this idea of like a pin sieve where you can like pull a memory out and save it somewhere um mm. so yeah I, I think that's kind of just like in the background Okay, so people are clear. What we just saw looks like a dream. It's mm -hmm. kind of fuzzy on the edges, a little bit of blur here and there. But the magic here is what we're seeing is the VR experiment I experience wearing a mm -hmm. VR headset. And to be clear, you're capturing on your iPhone or yep, Android on, phone, on I assume iPhone right now, yeah, iPhone right now, which has a fantastic phone. And I believe some some uh, sensors for depth yep, and whatnot. Yep. So we'll talk about how this is done. But you walk around a scene, mm -hmm. you use your proprietary app. So I'm not taking an old video and uploading it, am I? Uh, not yet. Um, that's not that's yet. on the roadmap. But yeah, right now it's just capturing that would be... feels just like a regular video. Yeah. So you, you take what feels like a regular video. When you're taking that capture video, mm -hmm. is it coaching you to, hey, go to the left, go to the right? Or is it giving nope. you some instruction? Or it's just uh, no, no, not slowly? right now. Um, and I, I think that's something that will be like uh, observing how, how people are using it. I think there's this desire for us to make something that feels as close as possible to what people are already doing. Um, and mm. I think that's like in part how, how we'll be successful. So then your software mm -hmm. does something to the video and perhaps other data captured on the sensors on the phone. So why don't you explain technically what happens between taking a video of your wife, you know, uh, getting the ultrasound, yeah. seeing the baby's yeah. heartbeat for the first time, and then grandma, or your grandchild someday. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, yeah. Watching their mother, their grandmother with their mother uh, getting an ultrasound with their mom. Right. Uh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it gets like, a little weird. Yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, well, like, it, I mean, you did see Strange Days. Yeah. Um, I, so I've not seen Strange Days. Oh, my God. See, yeah. this is really crazy. People have not seen the film, the Captain yeah, yeah. Bigelow film, Strange Days. You, you, this is your homework assignment. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's like the original uh, <laughs> Black Mirror. The, the premise is you could put on a headset 
Mm -hmm. that connects to your brain and it would not only make the video of what you're seeing it would have the actual feelings oh so if you were a boxer and somebody had you you, you had done a box boxing match i could put on the headset and relive the boxing match so people who were thrill seekers would use these and of course then it goes into dark areas of what else could you record horrible things happening to people like murders uh, and mm-hmm. other horrible things, and then relive them. Uh, Vincent D'Onofrio, Tom oh, Sizemore. Nice. Yeah. Uh, just, I mean, the cast is ridiculous. Ralph um, oh, yeah, Bynes, yeah. Angela Bassett, Juliette Lewis. I mean, it, I think it came out in uh, 95, 96, okay. somewhere in that yeah. time frame. Um, it, it was like yeah. really early. I was 24 years when it came out. You weren't born yet, I don't think. Maybe uh, I was born in 90, so yeah. It was yeah, you were five years old when it came out. Yeah, too young. Okay, so let's talk then, yeah. about the why this is what what technology makes this possible mm-hmm. today to go from an iphone to a vr headset because my understanding normally you would be doing something like this you would be stitching it together yeah so there's some like with very unique cameras or using what's the unity or something to stitch it all together right yeah so there's like a, a technology called photogrammetry that allows you to capture a lot of um, static images and stick it together um and that gives you a static model back um a static 3d model so like i could scan my house and walk around it but it's not alive like our memories are alive and so yeah what we're using using right now is um something called depth video and so we're capturing the video feed as well as a stream of depth data and so that allows us ah. to reproject that that video feed back into um back into 3d uh we do a couple other things to kind of like clean up some of the data and package it in a format that allows us to play it back more easily um and then yeah longer term like yeah looking at yeah how can you how can you upload existing captures and use some of the modern ML techniques to kind of synthesize some of the the depth data that wasn't captured originally? Um, and so that's something that, like, yeah, we're very much looking at for this year's roadmap. And the depth data that the iPhone can do, this is yeah. a relatively new uh, set of sensors. It's yes. only the, yeah. the most the recent ones. Years. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. these allow that blurry background to be so perfectly done am i correct uh when people do the portrait mode is that yeah, part of yeah, what absolutely what yeah. the, why this technology was so important for them i think because people love that blurry background portrait mode that yeah, makes yeah, sure yeah. the the person pop right yeah right T- tell us about those sensors and that technology and the api that apple has to do that and then maybe some oh. other uses for it yeah 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 i mean i think um yeah, right now it it kind of feels a little bit like Apple is, um, you know, maybe preparing for a larger project, maybe glasses that, um, yeah, right now a lot of the use is around, um, you know, mobile AR, you're on your phone, um, you're maybe in your living room and trying to place furniture again, maybe you're trying to test out different like paint swatches on your wall, maybe you're trying to like try on shoes or something like a, a virtual try on or like Warby Parker um, uses the front facing uh, depth camera to um, like mock glasses on your face mm. um so yeah those are some of the current uses around mobile ar um as well as some of the like scanning and, and 3d scanning stuff like um in and our our relation yeah i think is it is it is this part of the true depth stuff that's also on the face camera that lets it do right, so the it's, face um it's two separate sensors so there's like yeah. yeah there's like one depth sensor on the front for your face and then there's mm-hmm. on the pro model iphones there's a depth sensor on the back right yeah my understanding of this technology also is hey when you're doing the face recognition one of the key things here is the depth so it knows the depth yeah, of absolutely. you know how your eyeballs and your nose right. and all this stuff it can really start to build that model mm-hmm. so if we put this all together there was uh, breaking news just yesterday that uh tim cook um mm-hmm. was saying you know what we're gonna we're gonna get our our um apple goggles out i'm not yeah. saying you said any of this this was breaking in the news i don't yep, want to yep. screw up your relationship with apple this is me talking not you um but that he had said hey we're releasing it it's been seven years according to these reports that apple's been working on it yep. and a lot of these technologies that have been dripping out are the precursor to hey you might be able to use a tool like yours make this somebody has the apple yep. um glasses and then all of a sudden this gets built so you start working on something like this mm-hmm. and what is the business model today for the product and then how do you think about it you know in in a bigger picture of building a sustainable business in the face of well is this something that's going to be built into an apple or an oculus product is this already built into the facebook oculus product uh, and and how do you think about being in an emerging vertical as a founder 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, few questions there. So, like, uh, in in the middle one around around risk. Um, I mean, I think that's something that that everyone faces out sure. here. That like, um, yeah, almost anything we're building could become of interest. I think a um, advantage we have is that we are independent from any of those companies right now. And so, if you capture with us, um, our goal is to uh, yeah release. Um, apps on all of them so you can like view across you're not like locked into a a particular ecosystem um yeah which is incredibly important for your most intimate moments uh yeah for like building in an emerging market i think i think it's very exciting like it's something where um yeah we can see things take off extremely quickly if you think about like the first iphone launch and getting Mm. in early then um getting familiar with how to build for these kinds of devices um, because yeah it's not it's not like a mobile app it's yeah, it's a spatial computer. It's the the stuff is back in your world, and that's just a, a very different experience. Um, and then, yeah, I think I missed part of your question. Oh, but, business model, like uh, the, oh, business the, model. You know, yeah. Short term, long term, you have to be thinking about that because when we think about funding of companies, yeah, you have deep tech. This isn't ex- this is deeper tech, right? Uh, certainly, mm-hmm. but let's say you're not in a laboratory at Berkeley doing this, right? You yep. need to figure out a way to get a little bit of oxygen to keep the the vision going here. So. I guess, you know, product roadmap wise, what do you ultimately see this as going forward? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So like very short term, as in what we're shipping today is is free to use. Um in medium term, as in sometime this year, um, we are expecting a freemium model. Um, so we're still figuring out, still talking to to customers and stuff, but um, yeah, our expectation is a freemium model. Uh kind of thinking about like uh like Dropbox or Google Drive or iCloud, something that mm-hmm. allows you to use a service for a while. Um, especially as an emerging technology, and especially because we're yeah trying to capture your most important moments, um, we think it's important for users to like get familiar with it, like mm. really understand the value, and then those who are capturing a lot um, are probably those who want to be subscribed and like get either Got additional it. features so or yeah storage consumer subscription, storage, yeah. additional features. They all seem like uh, the yeah, big pretty, ones. Pretty I, standard. When you have a great idea like this, mm-hmm. and you build a mock up that's so compelling, uh, and I really do encourage people to go um visit uh the product and download the app where can they do that what's the uh, website yeah, so uh, they can sign up for the waitlist at wistlabs.com um got it. w-i-s-t wist yeah got it so we're we're not officially launched yet but you can go no, see private, all private this at Wist. Yeah. yeah so you want to get in there and be part of the private beta if you're listening to this podcast in all cases if you're listening to this podcast you clearly have an interest in startups and technology, but do you have the skills and knowledge you need for a career in tech? And if you do have those skills, are you still learning and growing? Because everyone in tech knows if you're not building new skills geared towards the latest platforms, well, you're falling behind. And right now, that platform is AI, artificial intelligence. AI isn't just the future, it's the present. We see that happening. We're talking about it every day on this podcast. And to be part of the tech revolution, you need to understand the core concepts behind AI, you know, things like neural networks, machine learning, these are complex terms, you can guess what they are, but why not go learn about these concepts at brilliant.org. This website helps users learn math, science and computer science interactively. And right now, they feature some amazing courses geared towards AI, like an introduction to neural networks, 15 lessons in that one and search engines, which includes 20 lessons on the core idea behind search engine technology. So here's your call to action. You can try everything Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days by heading to brilliant.org slash twist to start your free trial. And for a limited time, only twist listeners will get 20% off an annual subscription. I'm an investor in the company. It's a brilliant company. And uh, I really want you to try it for you and your company for kids, college, everybody in between everybody should get smarter. Let's all get brilliant together brilliant.org slash twist for 20% off today. One of the great things about an inspiring demo, and this is in mm-hmm. that category of inspiring demo, is everybody gets 10 ideas. Yeah. And says, well, ooh, you know what you should do? Yeah. You know, so it's, it's like when you open a restaurant, you got a hit restaurant, and you're like, you make burgers and fries, and people are like, you know what you should do? Hot dogs. You're like, yeah, that, but it's called Jason's Burger Joint. Like, it was right, going yeah. after burgers. But okay, sure. Yeah. Thanks for the recommendation. Oh, add on your rings? Okay, got it. Wow, you're a genius. Yeah. So I'll add myself to the people telling you you should add on your rings to the menu. Yeah, go for it. Um, I was just thinking if I had my child uh, when she was six year old, six years old, mm-hmm. uh, and you're a dad, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Child. Thank you. Yeah. I would love to take my 13 year old, make her a six year old again, 
and then make a video of my six, seven year old twins playing with my six, seven year old, now 13 year old. Yeah. Or take me as a child and have me, and I know I'm sounding like a lunatic right now, but have six, seven year old Jason, you know, playing or having a uh, hamburger, some French fries with my kids uh, or skiing with my kids. It would be yeah. mind blowing to see that. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think, possible? um, yeah, definitely and, and possible, possible today. Like my wife has talked about, um, so I've, uh, I think my oldest capture right now is like February, 2022. Mm. Um, and yeah, like she's been captured all throughout that. So, um, like throughout the pregnancy and after pregnancy and stuff. And yeah, she's talked about, um, yeah, it's just like a really powerful and moving experience to see her own body again and see how it's changed and see, like, see yes. herself become a mother, like from an outside perspective. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's wild that like, yeah, our son will grow up and he can go back to all these moments. Like he can see his mom before she was pregnant. And, wow. um, yeah, it's like. Mind blowing. Yeah, wild. Mind blowing. Well, I mean, there is something about reliving stuff. In fact, there is a in trauma work or in mm -hmm. therapy. Uh, I was a psychology major and I was actually going to go for clinical <laughs> at one yeah, point yeah. or industrial. And I remember there was a technique uh, where they would ask people to bring photos of themselves as children yeah. and to talk about themselves. Yeah. Uh, and inevitably you know some percentage of people would burst out crying because they would see themselves as a child and it would pull them into a memory mm -hmm. or if you took somebody yeah. to a location uh like their high school or their elementary school with a therapist or if they were trying to work through trauma they could actually go to the location and they would feel that sense and then the memories would come back it could be quite cathartic right yeah well here we are reliving the moment and then you add ai to this and there is yep. generative ai so you could take these videos and then say you know what let's we have a small video of this child, mm -hmm. you know, eating a hamburger. Let's have them playing with the dog that we see in the background. And you could actually make memory. So have you has the concept of generative yeah, yeah. AI um, so plugged into these models yet? Right. Yeah. So I, I think the generative AI side is something that is both um, incredibly crucial to the success of WIST, um, mm -hmm. but also something we want to be cautious about, right? Like, I think our goal is not to generate new memories that did not exist, um, but we can do things like fill in holes. So um, yeah, if I'm like capturing in my living room, but I only capture one side and not the other, um, we could take captures or we could take data from across all of your captures to kind of like fill back in the living room. Um, but yeah, I, I think we want to be cautious about like generating totally new memories or like bringing someone back from the dead like that. I think that's an, an area that, um, yeah, we would just want to tread very lightly. Well, I mean, you're now in Blade Runner territory. There's a scene in right, Blade yeah. Runner uh, where Decker goes and he has a stack of the memories of you know the 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 replicant that doesn't know she's a replicant i right, mean yeah. we sort of get into really crazy territory and they had actually put their memories in there yeah. uh into people and these replicants were so desirable to extend their lifespan and their memories were so important to them that the ability the the fact that they were going to lose their memories which they knew were manufactured was heartbreaking to them and yeah. that's where the famous poem at the end all these memories are now gone like tears yeah. in the rain right right yeah uh so yeah what do you what do you think you you could get into some dangerous territory there just people yeah definitely and, and psychology? i think yeah. yeah like it's it's um like so i i lost my grandmother in middle school um and we have some like photos and videos of her but it just like it doesn't feel the same as being being in a room with her again um and so i think like yeah, I would be interested in like up converting those photos and videos. Um, it like mm. it would be interesting to be able to like have a conversation with her. But I think that's that's all of a sudden in a territory where I know like because she didn't actually answer those questions, then it's mm. not actually her. And so, yeah, I think there's like a lot of ethical questions that um, yeah are, are probably like we can we can engage with the ethical questions. But I don't think that's something that we want to build. Yeah, I mean, somebody's going to build it. Um, or actually, people could do it right now. You could literally just go to Chad GPT right now. Yeah, right. Yeah. Give the data set of everything I've said on my podcast. Yeah, I, I think say, in one of our in one of our Reddit comments, yeah. someone mentioned that they had like they had done that with their grandfather. Um, <gasps> and after a few interactions, they were like, "Oh, this is this is too much. I will not show my grandmother this. I'm just going to like close it and never look at it again." Um, oh wow! So they they literally made uh a, a, a natural language model yeah yeah and i, I don't know too much because it was just like a reddit yeah, comment wow. but yeah yeah it's like no i mean yeah, it's a lot 
why we think about the trauma you could cause by having yeah. this you know magic box that is really like a fun toy then trigger the memories of your life partner for 50 years coming right. back and people are so desperate i mean yeah. we're basically writing black mirror episodes here you right. and I. people are so desperate for these memories they're so desperate for that lost connection and we're talking yeah. about in in grieving when when we all lose people and that's part of life um that people would do anything to bring people back in fact i think there's a stephen king novel about this yeah in a, in a movie about br bringing people back from the dead and and now you're you're starting to get into some unnatural areas that could be super traumatizing and right yeah, yeah. And, and that's like that's not our goal our goal is to no. yeah help you like honor and cherish all of your memories happy and sad um yeah yeah so how is the business going? How is fundraising going for a business like this? You're obviously it's a down market, but this is this week in startups. Yeah, we like to talk yeah. candidly yeah, about um, you know, building this. Is this is something you could build with, I would guess, two, three, four people, mm -hmm. you know, as a weekend project, but I think you've moved over from weekend project to, to full time status. This is moving over in that direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Um so I've I've been full time on it since uh uh what was it? M May or mm -hmm. March of twenty twenty one. Um so I, I before I was at Samsung leading a, a small group of ARVR designers and developers. Um, and yeah, left to kind of build a bunch of prototypes. Um, I knew something about memories and like spatial computing was important, but didn't know exactly what that would be. Mm. Um, yeah. And then in 2022, really like started building out the alpha on iOS and quest, um, found my co-founder. Um, yeah. And then we did this, uh, we did a small angel raise in the fall of last year. Oh, uh, great. The down market was not great. Um, in 2022 was, you did an angel in, round wow right yeah yeah and it was kind of like well done it was kind of like just as the news was coming out that you know valuations were decreasing people were less excited to fund stuff um yeah it was yeah. just about then that that was when we were starting to reach out to people so um bad timing but you know well, it is what you it know, is bad timing in some ways but there are not i can tell you there are not as many people in market uh, not as many entrepreneurs in market. Yeah. And then since investors are taking a little longer to make decisions, or some of them are frozen. So then you don't have like a crazy market just to tell you the experience on the other side of the table, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can get to know a founder, you, right. you can have them on your podcast, you could, you know, meet them and then say, Hey, when you get it launched, let me look at the first 100 data. And if anybody subscribes, you know, and, and right. if you can convert this via paid or whatever they need to see in terms of traction that gets them off the bench. And sure, a lower valuation, but I think you may have seen there's maybe more people available to work on projects now because people have been yeah. laid off. And yeah, definitely. You know, the, there's a lot more talent available today, and they're not going to say to you, this is your first startup? Uh, this is my second major startup, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the whole concept over the last five years was to convince somebody to not go to Google or not right. go to Samsung. Yeah. And, you know, depending on, you know, Samsung to Google is probably a factor of 2x in terms mm -hmm. of compensation at yeah, this point yeah, yeah. or at that point. And you're, you're basically competing against a person with a literally a money printing machine and, mm -hmm. and you have like a, a bag of shekels and you're trying to make yep. something happen. So yeah. now it's like people are like, yeah, I'll, I'll do it for equity. You know, valuations might be lower, but money goes further. Um, right. Yeah. This is all it's really interesting. This is all possible because of the depth cameras uh, mm -hmm. and this new sensor right. set and the progress on VR. Do you think it's ultimately the the consumer experience is going to be VR or do you think the entire industry is going to be this mixed reality leaning towards AR experience. Uh, yeah, in terms I, mean, of mass I, I definitely adoption. think we are, we are going towards AR glasses. Um, yeah, because that's like, yeah, it's like the, the holy grail. It's like the device that lets you see and experience and interact with anything. Um, hmm. And so, yeah, like that's, that's where we're going. I think some of the timeline is open um, and we'll find hmm. out what happens. Like, uh, yeah, Apple has been working on something, it seems like, forever. Um, and yeah, hopefully they talk more about that. Um, Meta, of course, had that leak recently that, um, yeah, like they will probably have another headset on the horizon for, for this year. Um, and oh, they are going to release the, one. Yeah. And I mean, I, at least there's, there's like a, there's a rumors a, of that. Yeah. Rumor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll keep you safe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For and people so, who don't understand why I'm trying to def <laughs> deflect any rumors to myself is because if you are a developer, uh, yeah. And I don't know the situation here. Mm -hmm. You might be under NDA with a company and you might be working on yeah, that with absolutely. their product on their new thing. So we're always very sensitive here on this week in startups to make sure we don't put a, a founder in a position where they um, break their NDAs or, right. you know, uh, mess up their um, relationships in any way. But they released like a $3,000 developer kit this year, correct? Over at Meta, there was um, some like really so high end the, one. Right. So there was a, um, 
there's a Quest Pro launch, um, yeah. and that was for um, between 1,000 and 1,500. Um, right. And basically, what what's different about that is that um, yeah, so it's still like still kind of VR because your eyes are covered, but mm-hmm. there are cameras on the outside that kind of like project what those cameras are seeing back into the headset. So the experience ends up being kind of like AR glasses. Um, and we we on f- in February we shared a video of our beta working on those, and so it's like. You see my living room, you see my couch, um, and then the memory of my wife holding our son is like reprojected Ooh. into that space. And does it sync? Does it know the couch or you, it just sort of you um, look so, that so direction? Right, right, now, it's it. um, right now it's manual. Right now it's manual, but yeah. Um, near future will be. Yeah, it'll like. So re-sync. this gets really interesting. I did use those, that Quest uh, VR Pro, whatever the, the it's pro called. One? Yeah, yeah. The pro one uh, over Thanksgiving. And, you know, this is <laughs> yeah. basically my. My yearly Thanksgiving or Christmas, uh, my, my, my brother in law, Ryan, always has the latest greatest and we put it on and i was playing a game like a star wars game Mm -hmm. uh it was quite compelling i did for about half an hour and then i started to feel a little nauseous which is i have i get motion sickness but it used to be i would get motion sickness after like the five minutes of beat saber i had to take it off yeah but this is really compelling when they when you can press a button and turn it off very quickly and without taking the headset off which is a little bit of work Mm -hmm. Um, it builds a 3D model of your, or just does the pass through video, and you can just see the space. Video, yeah. That's really compelling because if you're starting to feel nauseous or you don't know what's happening, mm-hmm. and I was playing some game where you throw a, it's like a racquetball kind of game. You throw a okay, ball yeah. up against the wall and it breaks stuff. And it was kind of like Breakout, but in 3D, mm-hmm. and it's and it's behind you too, so you're playing like in an arena. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was getting a little addicted to it, but again. 20, 30 minutes in, it was enough for me, but really does change the game when you can turn it off. And I could see a bunch of folks having Thanksgiving mm-hmm. uh, and saying, you know what, um, we're going to record some memories of Thanksgiving specifically yeah. to document these. And then if people weren't there uh, in future Thanksgivings, you could pull up that memory and just say, hey, let's have a memory with this person who, who's not here anymore. And we'll, yeah, we'll, absolutely. we'll play back their toast, right? I mean, how great would it be to have the toast my dad would give a toast every christmas i don't have any of them but if i had them from the 80s and 90s and my dad's still with us so he still mm-hmm. gets to give the toast but i would right. love to have those toasts where he gave a toast at christmas time and just replay them yeah yeah definitely and, and i think around use case like we are thinking about it as you know anytime i'm hanging out with my son and i would pull out my camera just to record something for like my mm-hmm. personal use um basically w- what we're seeing is instead of opening my like iphone camera i open the wist app and then mm-hmm. i record in there and so it's, yeah, like all those times that you would capture something for yourself um, mm. or maybe share with close friends and family. That's kind of where, where we're targeting. All right. Listen, this is great work. I'm very yeah, excited. Thanks. That Quest headset also, by the way, you know, as these things do, is now down to $999. Yeah. The Meta, yeah. Meta Quest Pro. Man, too many <laughs> names for these products. Drop yeah. the Meta, just call it the Quest and the Quest Pro. You, you don't need to have this many names, Facebook. Let me just help you. Quest is enough, or call it the Meta one and the Meta Pro. But yeah. Don't brand things three times. This is the Facebook Meta Quest Pro two. No, five names, not good. <laughs> and and how does the login work on those? That was the other thing that I thought was challenging. Is it now a Meta login when you log in, or your Facebook login, or your Instagram login? You can log in with anything. Um, that is a good question. I think right now it's uh, the Meta login plus maybe Instagram, but uh. yeah, I, I do not know exactly. This was the other problem I had with it is just like getting the thing up and running. Yeah. Finding apps, getting login, who's login am I in? And all that kind of stuff becomes super compl- complicated with these things. But I think they'll get there eventually. And right. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that's something that like, yeah, we're, we're thinking about too, because um, our, yeah, our goal is to kind of bring more people into the space, um, mm. but also be easy and accessible so that yeah you're not overwhelmed but um yeah definitely we need the the platforms to be easy to use so that once you get in our app it continues to be easy to use you know what would be a great paid feature since i'm going to tell i I told you about the onion rings i think now i'm going to tell you about chili fries or something yeah go for it (laughs) they could add to the menu is uh the ability to give prompts so Mm -hmm. i think there's a you know i always think about beachhead audiences when i'm working with founders Mm -hmm. yeah and then there's this group of people who are obsessed with archival stuff, right? Yeah. And they're the people who pay for ancestry.com and mm-hmm. other services like that genealogists, right? And there's like, yeah, one person in every family who takes on this role, sometimes two or three people do it, and then they bring it to everybody on the holidays. If you had prompts, and you said, here are prompts for 
you know, a grandma, grandpa, here are yeah. prompts for, for siblings when they're sitting next to each other. Here are prompts about childhood. Here are prompts about college for your sorority, for your fraternity. And you just had people tell stories, you know, here's yeah. a prompt for work culture and your startup. Then you could make that like those little templates. Like if you have notion or coda, right. it comes with templates, those yeah. templates and the audience being able to build them and genealogists being able to build them. That could be like your app store. So you, you know, you have an app store where it's like, here's what a genealogist would ask. Here's what a documentarian would ask. Yeah. yeah here's the, here's their top 15 questions. By the way, here's their next 25 questions for mm -hmm. $25. And I think the genealogy people, they're used to spending lots of money, hundreds of dollars a year yeah. getting document requests. So for them, like something that costs 25 bucks a month is not going to be crazy. So highly recommend, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That I, I think unless you have another beachhead market, I think parents are another good one because they, right, uh, yeah, they yeah, want think, to document. Um, some of the some of the early signal is um yeah around people who yeah feel the passage of time uh mm. yeah just feel the passage of time and so yeah like parents with um younger kids or families with aging parents i think is um like two mm. categories that kind of have bubbled up um but yeah you could also think about oh uh, maybe i'm younger and i'm like traveling to a place and this is like the first time i'm there and i really want to like capture all of this and, and remember as as i get older or like maybe it's high school and um you know this is like the last summer with my friends before we all go off to college mm. um and so yeah trying to find those moments and and weave our way in i wish you great success with the startup yeah, everybody so please uh go ahead and uh oh you did you have questions for me i saw in my notes that you might have had a question or two for oh, me sure yeah i mean you wanted, I think to, I, you wanted to reverse the tables which i always just so for founders who are listening to this week in startups of which there are many if you want to use this time to ask me a question at the end i mean i'm here to promote your stuff and, and learn about what you're doing but i'm always open for an ask jason at the end yeah, 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 definitely. Um, yeah, and, and closing out like some of the interview. Um, yeah, people can reach me at Andrew at Wislabs dot com. Um, Great, and yeah, that like yeah, happy to to field any questions there. Um, yeah, but then for you, yeah, thinking about some of the um stuff with SVB, and yeah, fortunately, it feel it seems like all that's um at, at the high level is taken yeah. care of. Um, yeah, we are kind of like at the very early stages of a raise. Um, mm. and thinking about yeah, I, gu I guess just how how do you think VCs in the next like two to three weeks are thinking about funding new companies versus still perhaps shoring up um, their existing portfolio. So it's a great question, Andrew. Um, and uh, by the way, the Twitter handle is Wist Labs, W I S T L A B S. So you can follow Wist Labs as well. That's a yeah. great way to follow startups in my experience. Um, it's a great question. Whenever there is a scary cataclysmic event like the one of this weekend, it will distract uh, VCs. Yeah. and angels and seed investors and make them want to uh, focus on their existing portfolio. Uh, this is the circle the wagons type moment. Okay, we're, we're not in explorer mode. We are in making sure everybody's at camp, we get a head count, everybody's yeah. safe, right? So I think that could take a couple of weeks for people to kind of like the shock grenades went off. Um, and we people's ears are ringing and there's a little fog of war right now. Yeah. I think if we don't see another two or three banks go under this week uh, or get rescued, whatever you want to call what's happening now to the two banks that this has happened to already, if we don't see more rescues, I think the ear ringing gets done in two weeks or so. And then we're back to business close to normal. Yeah. Uh, everybody will go through these two weeks saying, okay, how many bank accounts should you have? Right. How should you manage a treasury of, you know, a million dollars? That's obvious. Two or three bank accounts. How do you manage a $10 million one? Do I need to have five bank accounts? Do I put money in Bitcoin or, you know, Starbucks gift cards? I mean, people are losing their minds a bit. Yeah, um, yeah. And so that's, that's probably the, the path forward. I think most people in your stage, now mm -hmm. you've done this before, so you probably don't need to do that. And you raise some money during a down market. So you're obviously mm -hmm. good at raising money. You did it in 2022. So kudos on that. Well, maybe. Yeah, maybe we'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, it's like the degrees get harder sometimes, right. yeah. um, not easier. So, uh, but I do think it'll get easier in the second half of the year. The interesting thing that I think will, um, I think for most people in your position, I'd say go to an accelerator, uh, mm -hmm. if you can get into one because it's 100 or 200k for five, six, seven percent. And then you get validated, you get introduced to more investors in a cata, you know, uh, as a catalyzer. But if you already know how to do this, and you feel like your product is on the cusp mm -hmm. of maybe getting 10 paid customers, I think you will separate yourself with a product like this by being able to show just a trickle of revenue, mm -hmm. just 10 people buying the pro version. 
and knowing who those 10 people are and having them in a slack room or a signal room and being able to talk to them and understand them. Now, why do I say this? A lot of people in your position will get on the feature, uh, the never ending feature trail. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And they're like, well, if I get this feature, it's going to blow up. If I get this feature, it's going to blow up. And then it's the signaling from seed funds, which is where you're going to kind of live right now is Mm -hmm. the 250 K seed fund check. Uh, or so, and then plus angels or syndicates, that 250k seed fund, people are going to want to say, okay, if I can't get to series A, at least if they're burning 25k a month or 50k a month, can they cut that in half and get 10 or 20k a month in revenue so that the series A investor or future seed investors can kind of imagine, oh, they got 10 people, they could have a 1000. And and that's my best advice. And you know, sometimes you'll see that in fact, the generative, the thing that the generative AI folks had going for them was some of them had apps in the app store that would make pictures of you and they got 10,000 people to pay for it because it was so compelling and it's like well this person can build something compelling so that's really going to be the litmus test for you is this compelling enough yeah definitely yeah and i i think that like 10 moms pay for it or 10 dads rather right yeah and it's like it's so it's a little early for us to do the subscription yet um just Mm. because we haven't built it but um yeah, I think I think with that Twitter post, like our wait list increased um, over a thousand percent week over week. And so, yeah, it's mm. like, uh, yeah, it's it's clear that we are starting to get that signal that there's this this thing that is resonating with people. And yeah, we'll continue to dive into that. People we... do sell the wait list. I, I will tell you, like mm-hmm. when when you have revenue, you sell revenue and yeah, then you can yeah. even talk about the quality of the revenue yep. when you have earnings, when you have profit, when you have gross margin top line revenue, whatever people will sell the revenue. When you don't have revenue, people will sell the wait list or the user base, or they'll sell the user base. And then before that, they'll sell the wait list. And before that, they'll sell their pedigree, right? Right. So you're kind of always moving on to reality. And the closer you can get to the actual reality, I would say, you know, if you made it so the product let you do five of these, and then after that, you had to have a pro version. um, that, That could be a very easy way to test how it works. You can do five a month, and then we ask you to pay. Sure. Um, yeah. Or yeah. the watermark kind of situation. Yeah. Or you could do it based on the length of the video. So you can do 10 second videos, but you can't do 20 second. And, right. you know, hey, contribute to the product for this amount. And you can do more than five a month or more than 10 seconds. Unlock. Yeah. You have unlocking frequency and you have unlocking time because it's yeah. a video. So yeah. there's that's a really nice thing about where you're at. And mm-hmm. I think most, and then there's the watermark, which some people care about, some people don't. And then there's also sharing yeah. the link. Right. Yeah, paid. yeah, yeah. And I think sharing in multiplayer is um yeah, going to be really really core to us. Ooh, multiplayer forward. is just such a great. Multi just so people know, multiplayer means multiple people can work on the same project, like a shared document yeah. or a shared folder. So if you said, "Hey, I'm going to start a family one." And this is a great device for virality, yeah. by the way. If you said, "Hey, um uh this uh, um I want to if if you presented the family tree, people will fill it out and you say, "Hey, who is this?" and you say, "This is my my daughter." And then it says, "Oh, do you have any other kids?" And then who's your spouse? Who's the mom? Mm-hmm. Okay, what's the relation? My partner, my spouse would rather not say whatever. Yeah. Is there a grandma? Is there a grandpa? Is there a cousin? And then you start adding those. And then when you add the cousin, it says, hey, put their email in and share them. And do you want to invite your first level family tree or your second level family tree? And I would just look at how the genealogy companies have figured this out. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think with the genealogy direction, that's that's something that we are open to and exploring. But yeah, right now mm-hmm. the product is more about like, here is this camera for your memories and it's like straightforward easy to use familiar yeah yeah all right brother i am rooting for you congratulations uh and thanks for having me on oh i mean here's an easy way to get on this week in startups make something that's really effing compelling if something's really compelling and you see it in people's social feeds you've now put yourself in the bucket of people talking about ideas and who want to have coffee and chew your ear (laughs) Yeah, like literally, I could live in a coffee shop for ten lifetimes based on the number of people who want to have coffee with me. But then, once you put something in the world, and I saw it go by on my mm-hmm. feed, I was like, yeah. "Okay, that's that's good enough. Yeah, that's super fascinating. I can I can ask twenty questions about that." And here we yeah. are, thirty or forty minutes in of what was supposed to be a twenty minute, you know, quick hit. So well done, right. brother. Uh, yeah, and so everybody, go uh, follow Andrew. He is Andrew R. No, his uh, he's Arm the thinker if you want to follow his twitter and wist labs and the, uh, is the name of the company wist labs on twitter and wist labs dot com yep dot com. com oh wow you got the dot com wist labs dot yep. com we'll see you all next time in this week in startups bye bye okay that's it for today folks but before we go make sure you check out the founder university podcast founder.university slash podcast 
Each episode is a quick hitting tactical talk from entrepreneurs and operators. I created this new podcast because I didn't have room inside this week in startups to basically do tactical talks, right? These are really tactical. You might need one today. You need a different one tomorrow. So we're going to build a library of these. And there's an amazing talk with Richard Wang from Pilot. He walks us through how to understand your startup budget and optimize it for the current economy. Also, you'll get some tips on how to extend your runway. That can be found at founder.university slash podcast. Please go search in your podcast player and YouTube for Founder University Podcast and like it, subscribe to it, and give me your feedback. I'm Jason at Calacanis.com for life.